for fighting against racism inside the station. Addressing issues inside the station. If you listen to KPFA, they'll go against Iraq. They won't be for Libyan people, but they'll be for the Iraqis. Uh, most of the time, they'll be for the Palestinians. But when it comes to what's going on inside of KPFA itself, ever since 2009 with the beating of Nigel Foster, I'm not going to say it started there, but I'll say that was the biggest flashpoint uh, with the relationship that KPFA has with the black community. Nigel Foster was a woman who was lied, uh, lied upon by management at KPFA. She was eventually kicked between the legs, kicked in the head, her arm was stomped, she lost the baby and has a paralyzed arm, all because a manager lied and said that she was a trespasser. You can look up that information at the San Francisco Bayview newspaper and also on blockreportradio.com. The reference name is Nadra Foster. Nadra Foster. So I'm saying KPFA has a very complicated relationship. Another issue that KPFA has that relates directly to this, uh, to this event is there's a whiteout on Cynthia McKinney. You know, JR, David D, Greg Bridges, Walter Turner. The black broadcasters will air Cynthia McKinney, but where's all the other support for Cynthia McKinney? You know, that's what you guys got to ask yourself. Don't just take somebody saying that they're progressive media and take that at face value. Put them to the test. I don't care if it's KPFA, I don't care if it's KPOO, I don't care if it's the Chronicle, I don't care if it's the Black Report or the Baby. Put it to the test and ask, why are certain voices like uh, an international peace activist like Cynthia McKinney, who's more valid than most of the experts on KPFA to know what's going on inside of the U.S. government and outside this country, as well as with foreign policy, she's probably one of the most foremost experts that we have. But she's also barred from the airwaves. We call it a, a, a soft, a soft band, because it's not written anywhere. But why is she not on flashpoints? Why is she not on uh, uh, up front? Why is she not on Democracy Now? So some of you guys may have never asked these questions, but we're gonna have you asking these questions tonight. You know, we're not cutting no corners tonight. And before we bring up our honored guest, I want to bring up Willie Radcliffe, the publisher of the San Francisco Baby, who this is a fundraiser for. And I'd like for my daughter and my 
wife who is uh, the editor of the paper that does all the hard work, and she's been doing it for years. I would ask them to stand. that uh, for some reason picked up on the idea 
information and character making, actually turning me and the things that I stand for into some kind of caricature. So now it's like, you know, you can hear directly from me and some of the stories that I tell. Like, for example, one of the stories that I tell is what really my first disillusionment with the way things run on Capitol Hill. I was new, newly elected. I was a freshman member. I asked to serve on the International Relations Committee because I had studied international relations both as an undergraduate and a graduate student. And so I thought I had a little bit of expertise. And one of the things that I really wanted to do was to reshape U.S. foreign policy or help to reshape U.S. foreign policy so that human rights had a place in the formulation of our policy. And so I asked to serve on the International Relations Committee. One of the things I learned quickly was that nobody really, you know, that's not one of the desired destinations in the Congress because it's not a quote unquote money committee, meaning that constituencies that pay attention to what's going on on the International Relations Committee are not the constituencies that give a whole lot of campaign cash, unlike the Energy and Commerce Committee or the Ways and Means Committee or the Appropriations Committee. Those committees are called money committees, and everybody, there's a race to actually get appointed to those committees. And then, to top it off, not only was I interested in the International Relations Committee, but I was interested in the Human Rights Subcommittee. Nobody cares about human rights when you're up there. You, it takes a million dollars to run a campaign to get reelected, and so you're going to go to the Human Rights Subcommittee? So I didn't have very much competition. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm on the International Relations Committee. I'm at a hearing, and there's a senior guy who's the chairman. Democrats were in charge at that time. And He's a chairman, and he is just railing against one of the witnesses. He is railing, he's castigating him up and down and talking about how badly things are being done and how things have got to change. He's doing all of this stuff, and I thought he was serious. Until after the committee hearing was over, and he grabbed the witness unbackslapped it and they walked out of the room arm in arm. <laughs> it was all just theater. And that was my first sense of, wow, this isn't really what I thought it was about. Because for me, it wasn't about theater. I really believed and, and I, wanted to make change and I, I had confidence in the institution. And time after time after time, I learned the power of the institution, but what I also learned is that that power of the institution and the individuals inside the institution was subverted by something else that we call special interests. They utilize the power that the individual member of Congress has for their own purposes. You could say that the power of the institution, of the individual inside the institution has been hijacked away from the people's interests and then steered and misdirected toward the special interests. And that was a lesson that I learned over and over and over again. And what I also saw was that it was so difficult to do the average, ordinary, common sense things. It was difficult to do those things. And it was easy to do the bad things. Because the bad things, generally the ones that weren't supported by the people, that the people didn't need to necessarily know about, with the little special uh, nips and tucks that go inside legislation, no, they don't want you to know about those things. But those are the things that got slipped into bills because, of 
course, that was where the money was. You slip something into a bill, and then you get a nice fat series of campaign contributions, and you're able to win re-election again. And there are some members of Congress that are still there who calculate on the scorecards 50%. So they want to make 50% on the NAACP scorecard, 50% on this scorecard, 50% on the NRA scorecard, 50% on the American Chamber of Commerce scorecard. So if, if, they, if they measure their votes so that they get 50%, then they've offended no one. And this is a calculation 